For decades, one assumption in nuclear engineering barely changed. Thorium reactors were interesting on paper, but nowhere close to real operation. That assumption quietly broke in 2024, not during a public announcement and not with a grand unveiling, but through a small research reactor that forced nuclear programs in the United States, Europe, and India to re-examine something they had largely written off. This reaction didn't come from hype. It came from verification, because for the first time, a reactor across the line thorium concepts had never crossed before. At first glance, what triggered that reassessment looks underwhelming. The reactor is small. It produces only a few megawatts of heat. It does not power cities or feed the grid. So why did this specific experiment matter enough to ripple through the global nuclear community? What exactly did China operate that no one else has? And does this milestone represent a genuine shift in nuclear technology or just another experiment that will never scale? To answer that, you first need to understand what China actually built and why this reactor challenges assumptions the nuclear industry has held for half a century. The reactor at the center of this story is known as TMSR LF1, short for Thorium Molten Salt Reactor, Liquid Fuel 1. It is located near the city of Wuwei, on the edge of the Gobi Desert, and is operated under China's National Nuclear Research Program led by the Chinese Academy of Sciences through its Shanghai Institute of Applied Physics. This is not a prototype sitting behind glass, and it is not a short-duration experiment switched on for a few hours at a time. TMSR LF1 received its operating license in mid-2023. It reached first criticality in October 2023, and in 2024, it entered sustained full-power operation. In nuclear engineering, those steps matter more than press headlines. Licensing means regulators approve the design and safety case. Criticality means the reactor achieved a stable nuclear chain reaction. Sustained operation means it ran continuously under controlled conditions, producing heat day after day. That is the threshold where theory becomes hardware. The reactor produces roughly 2 megawatts of thermal power. By commercial standards, that is small. It does not supply the grid, and it is not intended to. But size is not the point at this stage. TMSR LF1 exists to answer questions that no simulation can settle. How do materials behave when exposed to molten salt for months, not hours? How stable is the chemistry when fuel is dissolved directly into a circulating liquid? How does a reactor control system respond when the fuel itself is moving? These are questions Western nuclear programs largely stopped asking decades ago. Molten salt reactors were explored in the United States during the Cold War, but the industry ultimately standardized around solid fuel, water-cooled designs. That path favored large, centralized plants and an industrial supply chain optimized for uranium fuel rods. China chose a different path. Instead of refining existing reactor types, it revived a class of reactors that had been shelved because they were difficult, not because they failed. And it did so inside a tightly controlled, state-funded research environment where long development timelines were acceptable. That context matters. Private nuclear companies tend to chase new-term deployment and regulatory certainty. National research programs can afford to spend years validating materials, chemistry, and operating behavior before scale ever enters the discussion. TMSR LF1 is a product of that approach. It is not designed to win on efficiency today. It is designed to accumulate operational experience that compounds over time. And in nuclear engineering, the country that gathers real operating data first tends to shape what comes next. To understand why this reactor matters, you have to understand why thorium stayed on the sidelines for so long. Most nuclear reactors run on uranium-235. It is fissile, meaning it can sustain a chain reaction on its own. The global nuclear industry was built around that property, from fuel enrichment to reactor design and regulation. Thorium works differently. Thorium-232 is not fissile. It cannot sustain a chain reaction by itself. Instead, it absorbs a neutron and slowly converts into uranium-233, which is fissile. Only after that conversion can it contribute to fission. That extra step complicated everything. It added uncertainty to reactor physics. It complicated fuel management. And it delayed energy output compared to uranium. For decades, those drawbacks outweighed the benefits. Molten salt reactors change that balance. Because the fuel is liquid and constantly circulating, thorium does not need to be fabricated into solid rods. It can be introduced directly into the molten salt, where conversion happens inside the operating reactor. That was the promise. What China has now shown is the first operational step toward proving it. In late 2024, 
thorium was added to TMSILF-1 during operation. By 2025, researchers reported experimental data confirming thorium to uranium conversion under real reactor conditions. That is the milestone behind the headlines. Not unlimited fuel. Not a reactor that feeds itself forever. But verified fuel cycle behavior inside a working system. This distinction matters. Online narratives often blur the line between design goals and proven results. What China demonstrated is narrower, but far more credible. China now has measured data on how thorium behaves in a liquid fuel reactor over time. That data shapes reactivity control, waste profiles, safety margins, and future scale-up decisions. Thorium also carries strategic appeal. It is abundant and does not rely on the same enrichment infrastructure as uranium-235, reducing exposure to sensitive fuel supply chains. Until now, thorium was mostly theoretical. TMSILF-1 moves it into observation. And once a fuel cycle enters observation, progress tends to accelerate. Thorium alone is not what makes this reactor different. The real shift comes from how the reactor is built. Most nuclear plants today follow the same basic architecture. Solid fuel pellets are sealed inside metal rods and cooled by water. To keep that water from boiling, the system operates under extreme pressure. That pressure defines everything. It shapes plant size, containment design, safety systems, and emergency procedures. It also creates the failure modes people associate with nuclear accidents, where loss of cooling or pressure control becomes the central risk. Molten salt reactors break from that model. In TMSR LF1, the fuel is dissolved directly into a liquid salt that flows through the reactor core. There is no solid fuel to crack or deform, and no high-pressure water system holding the reactor together. The reactor operates at near-atmospheric pressure. From an engineering standpoint, that single fact changes the entire problem space. Lower pressure reduces mechanical stress and removes whole categories of failure scenarios that dominate conventional safety analysis. It also allows higher operating temperatures. Higher temperature improves efficiency and supports industrial heat applications that traditional reactors struggle with, including hydrogen production and chemical processing. But this design introduces harder challenges. Molten salt is chemically aggressive. At high temperatures, it attacks metals and weakens alloys. Corrosion is not a side issue. It was a primary reason earlier molten salt program stalled. Chemistry control is another hurdle. Because the fuel is liquid, fission products mix directly into the circulating salt. Maintaining chemical balance over long periods requires precise control. Small deviations can affect reactivity and materials behavior. Instrumentation adds further complexity. Sensors must survive heat, radiation, and corrosion at the same time. Maintenance becomes harder because systems cannot simply be opened or swapped. This is where China's approach matters. TMSR LF1 is not optimized for output. It is optimized for learning. Every hour of operation produces data on corrosion, chemistry stability, control behavior, and system response. And that data answers the question that stalled molten salt reactors for decades. Not whether they work on paper, but whether they can operate reliably over time. And for decades, this exact question is where molten salt reactors quietly failed. This is the point where the story usually gets overstated and where credibility is either earned or lost. China did not announce a commercial reactor. It did not unveil a system ready to replace coal plants. And it did not prove a reactor that can refuel itself forever. The actual world first is more precise and far more defensible. TMSR LF1 is the first molten salt reactor in the world to operate with thorium fuel loaded into the system and brought to sustain power. Not a test loop. Not a short experiment. An operating reactor running under regulatory approval. That distinction matters. For decades, molten salt reactors existed in reports, simulations, and controlled laboratory setups. Thorium fuel cycles were discussed almost entirely in theory. Even when experimental work was done, it stopped short of sustained, licensed operation. This reactor crossed that boundary. By loading thorium into a liquid fuel system and operating it at power, China created a platform where fuel behavior, conversion rates, chemistry stability, and control response can be observed directly over time. That is something no paper study can substitute. It is also where many viral claims blur the line between what is proven and what is promised. Molten salt reactors are often described as capable of online refueling. In principle, that is true. Liquid fuel allows fuel addition without the physical shutdowns required by solid fuel reactors. 
But adding thorium to a reactor is not the same as proving continuous, industrial-scale fuel reprocessing during operation. The latter involves complex chemical separation systems that remain one of the hardest challenges in molten salt reactor development. China has been careful in its official language. State releases consistently describe TMSRLF1 as a research platform, not a finished energy solution. Public statements focus on thorium addition, fuel cycle experimentation, and operational data collection. They do not claim a finished solution. They frame TMSRLF1 as a research platform designed to reduce uncertainty step by step. That restraint is important. Because in nuclear engineering, credibility compounds. Each verified milestone carries more weight than 10 bold promises. And once a country demonstrates that it can operate a new reactor class safely and consistently, the conversation shifts. The debate moves from whether the concept works at all, to whether it can scale, how fast, and under whose standards. That is the real meaning of this world first. The location of this reactor is not a footnote. It is part of the strategy. TMSR LF1 was built near Gobi Desert, close to the city of Wuwei in Gansu province. This region sits far from major population centers, with wide open land and tight access control. For an experimental nuclear system, that matters. Remote siting reduces risk during early operation. It simplifies licensing, and it gives engineers more freedom to test systems over long periods without public pressure. But geography is only part of the reason. Western China is water scarce. Traditional nuclear power plants depend on large volumes of water for cooling. Even modern designs struggle in arid regions where rivers are limited and drought risk is rising. Molten salt reactors change that equation. Because they operate at high temperatures and low pressure, they can use alternative cooling strategies that rely far less on water. Chinese research institutions have consistently highlighted this advantage, especially for inland and desert regions. That makes the Gobi an ideal proving ground. If a reactor concept cannot operate reliably in a harsh, water-limited environment, it will struggle anywhere else. If it can, its potential deployment map expands dramatically. There is also a longer-term planning layer. China's western provinces have historically lagged behind the coast in industrial development. Energy availability has been a limiting factor. High-temperature reactors capable of providing steady heat and power could change that balance. Not tomorrow, not at grid scale yet, but as a pathway. This is why TMSRLF1 is framed as more than a one-off experiment. It is a test case for how advanced reactors might support industrial activity in regions where conventional energy infrastructure is constrained. By proving operation in the Gobi, China is not just testing a reactor. It is testing whether a new class of nuclear systems can function where others cannot. And that question has implications far beyond a single site. The reaction outside China has been quiet, but it has not been casual. The United States pioneered molten salt reactor research in the 1960s. The work proved the concept could function, but it never moved beyond experimental scale. The industry standardized around water-cooled reactors, and molten salt programs faded into archives. India followed a different path on paper. It holds large thorium reserves and built long-term plans around thorium fuel cycles. But despite decades of discussion, India still does not operate a molten salt reactor using thorium. Europe has active research programs and pilot concepts. None are operating at sustained power with thorium fuel. China now is. That difference matters because nuclear technology advances in steps, not leaps. The first country to operate in new reactor class sets in formal benchmarks long before formal standards exist. Operating experience shapes how regulators think. It influences what safety questions get asked first. And it determines which technical challenges are considered solvable versus theoretical. This is where leverage begins to form. When international bodies like the International Atomic Energy Agency assess emerging reactor technologies, operational data carries disproportionate weight. Designs that exist only on paper remain speculative. Designs that run accumulate credibility. That credibility affects funding, collaboration, and regulatory pathways. It also affects who gets invited to define rules. Licensing frameworks for molten salt reactors do not yet exist at scale. Whoever demonstrates stable operation first has an outsized influence on how those frameworks take shape. China understands that dynamic. By operating TMSR LF1 now, even at small scale, it places itself ahead in a process that usually unfolds over decades. Other countries can still catch up, but they will be doing so against a reference system that already exists.
This is why the global response has been less about headlines and more about internal reassessment. Research budgets are shifting. Dormant programs are being reopened. And long-ignored reactor concepts are being pulled back into serious discussion. Not because China solved every problem, but because it solved enough of them to make the rest worth pursuing. And once that threshold is crossed, the pace of competition changes. This is where the stakes come into focus. China's thorium reactor did not end the nuclear debate. It moved it forward. Scaling from a 2-megawatt research reactor to a 100-megawatt demonstration plant is not a simple upgrade. Materials behave differently over years instead of months. Chemistry control becomes harder. Licensing grows more complex. And economics start to matter in ways experiments never face. China knows this. Its own institutions frame the next step as a demonstration target around the mid-2030s, not a guaranteed outcome. But here's what has changed. China now holds something no one else does. Operating experience with a thorium-loaded molten salt reactor. Real data. Real lessons. Real constraints discovered the hard way. That experience shapes everything that follows. It influences how future reactors are designed. It informs regulators before rules are written. And it defines which problems are real barriers and which ones are manageable. Other countries are not locked out of this race. But they are no longer starting from the same line. In nuclear development, being second is often the same as being late. And that leads to the question this story leaves behind. If molten salt reactors do scale, if thorium fuel cycles mature, and if high-temperature nuclear systems become practical in water-scase regions, who will be ready first to deploy them at meaningful scale? Because the world first China just achieved was not about power output. It was about positioning. And in nuclear technology, positioning early often decides who leads later.